when one discusses Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta is a unique city as it represents some of the highest aspirations and achievements of black people in the United States. However, it bears witness to some of the most destitute conditions that one can think of. Um, in a brief history of Atlanta, to kind of lay out the context of why Atlanta is unique, particularly when we talk about civil rights, there's some things that we must consider. First and foremost is pre-1847, Atlanta was not necessarily a true city, uh, but was really a train station. And so it was an intersection between railroads that would connect trains from the Atlantic to the Midwest and on into the West. The Atlanta starts out um, being called terminus as, as a, uh, a train hub and then it was later called Thrasherville. However, as early as 1840, it was renamed Marthersville, which was named for the governor at the time, uh, the, the daughter of the governor at the time. And so what happens is there was a suggestion that what we know of as Atlanta today will be named Atlantica Pacifica because of the railroads. And in order to shorten it, um, it was called Atlanta. Now, I want to give you all a brief history uh, of some things that take place in Atlanta that, make, that makes Atlanta unique. In 1864, uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman, in his War is Hell campaign in order to break the back of the South, uh, which is known as the hard years of the war, he came through Atlanta, pulled up all of the railroad tracks, he burned down all of the plantations, and as a result of this, African Americans followed William Tecumseh Sherman to the city that would be later known as Atlanta. And they settled at what is now the corners of Auburn Avenue and Cortland Street. And what's unique about this is once blacks, newly freed blacks came to the city of Atlanta, they were then under federal protection because of the Freedmen's Bureau uh, troops that were there. Um, because of this, and because black folk had received word of uh, the kind of protection that one could get in Atlanta. It became a hub where numerous uh, black folk from across the South migrated, but it also became a space where white missionaries from the Northeast would come to set up schools, um, schools that would be useful for parts of the black community, but could be seen as problematic in terms of the, the, the way in which they saw the newly freed blacks. Uh, many of these white missionaries were extremely paternalistic and their thought was that they were coming to Atlanta to educate these former slaves or these savages. And, and so what we have here is between 1865 and 1883, we have the creation of six historically black institutions of higher learning. Um, the first of which was Atlanta University founded in 1865 by the American Missionary Association. The second was Morehouse College founded in 1867. It was actually founded as the Augusta Bible College in Augusta, Georgia, but later moves to Atlanta and becomes the Atlanta Bible College. And later um, it becomes Morehouse College and it's founded by the American Baptist Home Mission Society. You then have Clark University, which can sometimes often be substituted as Clark College, which is founded in 1869 by the Methodist Episcopal Church, the white Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, you have Spelman College that was founded as the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary in 1881 uh, by the American Baptist Home Mission Society. And then you have Gammon Theological Seminary that was founded in 1883. What this was is this was a religious department. And so what happens here is not only do you see African Americans or, or coming to the city of Atlanta uh, to seek better conditions than they had before pre-emancipation, uh, b before the war. What you begin to see now is you see a group of black folk that are moving to the city to educate themselves. Um, right after this time, Henry Grady, who was the managing, the, the managing editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, coined the term the New South, and he doted Atlanta as its capital. The problem with the New South is it promoted this idea of an industrious South, a South that was based on commerce uh, instead of the agrarian past that it was noted for. But what also comes from this is it still left black folk 
out of that equation. And what happens here is that the belief was that black folk were supposed to serve in industries of service. To add to that is here at Piedmont Park, um, in a, here in Atlanta, Georgia, the famous educator and deemed leader, uh, Booker T. Washington, delivered a speech at the Cotton States and International Exposition in 1895, which gave the legal language for segregation. One of the things that he did is he talked about how blacks should do away with the idea of political rights and civic rights, but should focus on economic rights. And as a result of this, one of the things he stated is that in all things economic, we can be as equal as a closed fist. In all things uh, political and social, we can be as separate. And so uh, the United States Supreme Court at the time through later in 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson used that language and they come up with the legal language of separate um, but equal and codify that into law. What comes about after this, though, is we see this unique onslaught of black business that emerges on in the Sweet Auburn district and on West Hunter Street. Uh, of superior note, the Atlanta Life Insurance Company was the first black insurance company founded um, by Alonzo Herndon, who was a very prominent uh, barber in the city. Uh, Mr. Herndon was born in Social Circle, Georgia, uh, in Walton County, which is about an hour east of the city. Um, he was born into slavery with a white father and enslaved mother. Uh, and after the Civil War, he moves to Clayton County, Georgia, which is just south of the, of the city of Atlanta, uh, goes to barbering school, and he starts a barbershop downtown Atlanta at Peachtree. And here he served an all-white clientele. And his idea was for the barbers to dress, you know, very nicely to provide a gentleman's atmosphere. And as a result of this, he would hear the white businessmen talk shop. He made friends with some of the white businessmen and he buys up many of the benevolent society um, insurance policies of numerous churches. And thus you have the first black insurance company that's founded. Um, 1906, however, yields a, a new thing where we see the city that is marred by the Atlanta race riots in which uh, numerous black folk were killed, maimed, uh, places of black business were, um, were burned. As in oftentimes when we talk about race rebellions, and that's the new language in which, you know, when we talk about urban rioting, that's the language that, that we begin to discuss. In terms of this race riot, what it was is it was trumped up on, under the auspices that a black man had sexually assaulted some white woman. Um, however, when you peel the layers back, you really begin to understand that this is really a conversation around economics. And so there was an idea amongst um, whites in the city of Atlanta that black folk had received too much prominence in terms of business and commerce and were seen as competition. And so this race riot ensues. Um, by 1924, and this is just after World War I, um, the city is able to open its first black public high school, and this will be Booker T. Washington High School, which is located um, on the western uh, side of the city of Atlanta. By 1928, the Atlanta Daily World is founded by the Scott family. It's founded by uh, W.A. Scott. Uh, his brother, C.A. Scott, was, uh, was a part of this. But this was the first daily newspaper of the black newspapers. And what's particularly significant about it is that a black newspaper oftentimes chronicled issues that would take place in the black community that the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or the New York Times or um, other mainstream newspapers would not chronicle. So we, Atlanta creates the Atlanta Daily World um, as we see it in other places. We, you know, the Chicago Defender in Chicago, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, uh, the Amsterdam Daily in New York City. And so Atlanta has its, its own newspaper. In 1946, we see um, John Wesley Dobbs, who was considered to be the unofficial mayor of the Sweet Auburn District, the black business thoroughfare in Atlanta, along with A.T. Walden, who was, a, who was an attorney that did a lot of the early work in the city of Atlanta. Um, they found the Atlanta Negroes Voter League, and they found it right on the heels of the uh, King versus Chapman court case. And what this was is a black man by the name of Premius King 
uh, in Columbus, Georgia, Muskogee County, which is on the border of Alabama, uh, decides to, ch to challenge the all-white Georgia primary. And after subsequent uh, court cases, the all-white Georgia primary is struck down. And in order to, to gain momentum in terms of black political empowerment and electoral politics, the Atlanta Negroes Voter League was founded as an organization that would galvanize the black vote. Um, it was founded as a Republican uh, institution uh, because during this time the Republican Party was seen as the party of Lincoln, uh, the great emancipator, and, and that's problematic in its own terms. Uh, however, if you fast forward 25 years, what we begin to see is that the protégés of John Wesley Job, Dobbs, uh, Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr., and the protege of A.T. Walden, Leroy Johnson, they both run as Democrats for uh, mayor. Uh, they faced, faced off with each other for the city's top position in terms of mayor. Uh, Maynard Jackson wins that uh, and serves as a three-term mayor, but Leroy Johnson becomes a state senator. What we see in terms of race relations is in 1948, Atlanta hires eight black police officers. Now, these police officers were hired for ceremonial um, bliss. They were not allowed to arrest uh, whites. Um, they had to dress in the Butler Street YMCA, which is a particular YMCA amongst the black community that housed political forums such as the Hungry Club uh, and other issues that took place in the black community. However, um, the black community was, was proud of the idea that they had jobs, but again, um, as seen in numerous black communities, they were not very trusting of the police because of police brutality. Um, there, was a, there were many instances of police brutality, particularly in terms of white police uh, during this time. In 1956, uh, Mayor William Hartsfield deems Atlanta as a city too busy to hate. And there are a couple of different things going on at this point in time. In 1954, we have the Brown v. Board of Education decision that takes place. And what it does is it outlaws segregation. So it reverses uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and one of the things of particular interest, particularly it will here in, in Georgia, is that the state flag goes from being a flag, uh, the, the national flag for the Confederacy, and they put the Southern Cross or the Confederate battle flag on the state flag, and this is seen as direct recal white recalcitrance and resistance to Brown v. Board of Education. And so what we begin to see is the shutdown of numerous public school systems because states' rights has reared its ugly head. Now, with this, William Hartsfield is saying that Atlanta is a city too busy to hate. However, what, what the city of Atlanta has done is it has juxtaposed itself with other activity going on at the same time to where it is showcasing, the city of Atlanta is showcasing itself it's not being Montgomery, in which the Montgomery bus boycott is taking place at the time, or Jackson, or Little Rock, or, or some of the more hotbed battleground places. And what William Hartsfield argues is that Atlanta is a city too busy to hate because it has this vibrant, vibrant black educated and upper class. And as a result of that, they are like-minded with the white business elite in the city. And so much of this is smoke and mirrors in terms of how we understand civil rights. Um, in 1960, a new more radical newspaper emerges called the Atlanta Inquirer. And it's, it's a black newspaper and it chronicles uh, some of the more radical issues going on in the black community as juxtaposed with the Atlanta Daily World, which was seen as a more conservative newspaper. And so here we begin to see these splits between black communities in terms of more radical, um, or as some would say, you know, working class uh, versus this conservative, which is a black upper and middle class kind of ideology. However, in 1961, before the rest of the American South, Atlanta integrates its schools. And so one of the interesting things about Brown v. Board of Education is when the U.S. Supreme Court uh, delivers this verdict, um, they then come back and do a Brown II decision and they use the legal language that stated with all deliberate speed. And so what that meant is that the states could take the time to integrate their schools um, as, as, as soon as they wanted. Um, 1965, Q.V. Williamson 
is elected to the city's, uh, is, is the first black man elected to Atlanta's alderman board. And what goes on here is we see black political empowerment and electoral politics. Um, but we also see some other issues that begin to manifest. Um, just because black folk are able to vote does not mean that it remedies all of the problems. And what we begin to see is in 1966, we see the Summerhill riots that take place, or the Summerhill rebellion that takes place when a young, a young man is shot by the police, is not killed, but the city erupts. And this is on the verge of the new Fulton County Stadium where the Atlanta Braves uh, played baseball and the Atlanta Falcons would, would, would let it play. They would share this facility until the Georgia Dome was built in the early 90s. In 1967, we see the Dixie Hill uh, Rebellion, where, again, uh, a man was targeted, uh, a black man was targeted and shot by the police, um, and all hell breaks loose, uh, just quite honestly. And so we begin to see these things. But by and large, um, in 1968, what we began to see and understand is the assassination of, the most, of, of Atlanta's most beloved son, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And unlike other cities such as Chicago or Washington, D.C. or Detroit, Atlanta doesn't burn. It doesn't rebel like these other places. And so there's some particularly interesting things that take place when we begin to talk about Atlanta as a civil rights city. Now, I want to back up and give you some context for Atlanta, for the civil rights movement. Um, in yesteryear, in a more outdated understanding of civil rights, oftentimes it was believed that civil rights, the civil rights movement starts in 1954 and it ends in either 1965 um, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act coming out of Selma, Alabama, or it ends with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, some would say that then black power emerges. However, some of the new schools of thought kind of knocked down this idea of the 1954 to 1968 uh, periodization. And what new scholars began to do is to look at civil and human rights that took place outside of that, that, that framework. And so it is argued that you know, as long as there has been poverty in what we know of as the United States, there's always been a human and civil rights movement. That's, that's part of it. Another part of it is what we cannot deny is that Atlanta is a unique civil rights city because it was never really a battleground. When you juxtapose it with places such as Selma and Birmingham, to, to give you case in point, the 1963 campaign when Dr. King was incarcerated and wrote the letters from the Birmingham jail, what we began to see um, were the people marching and protesting in mass. And as a result of that, when Bull Connor, Eugene Bull Connor, the public safety director in Birmingham, um, pushed fire hoses and put dogs on children that were really trying to, to champion human rights, and the world saw that. President Lyndon B. Johnson then signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which buttressed the 14th Amendment, which gave equal protection and due process under the law. Fast forward two years in Selma, Alabama, um, black folk are working to gain the right to vote. What is of most note is after the American Civil War and with newly freed uh, blacks um, from slavery, yeah, the passage of uh, legislation that changed the lives of, of African descended people in North America. Uh, the first would be the 13th Amendment, which was passed in 1865. The second would be the 14th Amendment that is passed in 1868. And the third is the 15th Amendment that was passed in 1870. The 13th Amendment abolished servitude. Um, and so it, it outlawed the fact that someone could serve in a capacity of one that has been enslaved. Uh, the 14th Amendment grants equal protection and due process under the law. And this is particularly unique in, uh, because of the Dred Scott decision that takes place in 1857, which starts some of the dress rehearsal for the American Civil War. And the 15th Amendment uh, granted men the right to vote, and women would later 
uh, be granted the right, the right to vote at the time. However, in the 1960s, when we begin to talk about civil and human rights, what happens is in 1962 in Albany, Georgia, Dr. King decides that um, Albany would be a campaign uh, to where black folk would get the right to vote or would get some kind of notoriety or publicity as to part of the problems with second class citizenship and racism and white supremacy in the United States. Um, as a result of this, the sheriff in Doherty County at the time, um, Sheriff uh, Laurie Pritchett, intellectually reads everything that Dr. King writes. And he knows and understands Dr. King's strategies in terms of nonviolent direct action. And as a result, he orders his men to peacefully um, incarcerate the marchers and you know, to, to be respectful to them. And so as a result of this, the Albany movement see, is seen as one that failed. So what happens is Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, they look for an area where they could find someone that was just arrogant and um, impulsive enough to react in a negative way. And they found Birmingham, Alabama's Eugene Bull Connor, who was the public safety director for the city. Around um, the, the period of Easter, um, Birmingham was unique, was, was particularly interesting because uh, the department store that would sell clothes uh, during Easter would not allow blacks to try on the clothes, and so blacks were being treated as second-class citizens. Uh, Dr. King shows up in Birmingham and, and promotes the Birmingham campaign, and what he's able to do um, is to, he galvanizes the people, but then he's thrown in jail, and this is where he writes the letters from the Birmingham jail. Well, as a result of this, when black folk begin to take to the street and protest second-class citizenship, um, Bull Connor orders for fire hoses to be turned on the children and protesters and dogs to be turned on them. And as a result of this, when the American media and international media captured this video and shown it around the world, it showed the United States as being a farce in terms of being a, a champion for democracy, land of the free, home of the brave. So as a result of this, Lyndon B. Johnson passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which buttresses the 14th Amendment and grants equal protection and due process under the law. Fast forward two years, uh, well, one year from the civil rights legislation. Uh, in 1965, uh, black folk were really just trying, particularly in the deep south, were trying to um, exercise their right to vote, which is granted by the 15th Amendment. Uh, because of states' rights and white supremacy, black folk in the black belt of Alabama, an overwhelmingly black area, um, were not granted the right to vote in Dallas County. And so as a result of blacks trying to vote, um, a young man by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson is shot and killed by the police. And what this articulates is that the Black Lives Matters movement is not a new thing. There's always been an issue uh, with black men and the police, uh, particularly innocent black men and the police. And so Jimmy Lee Jackson is shot by the police. And as a result of this, um, movement people, grassroots organizers, as well as some of the others came together and decided that they would march from Selma to Montgomery, which is about 45 miles across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and, and, and peacefully do so. But when they crossed the bridge, the Alabama state troopers, the state-sanctioned police, beat and maimed protesters, black and white. And as a result of this, Lyndon B. Johnson, not wanting to uh, misrepresent what the United States purportedly stood for, uh, passes the Voting Rights Act of 1965. However, um, we see activity that takes place outside of that periodization. So we see activities such as um, A. Philip Randolph's organizing uh, of the Sleepy Car Porters. Uh, we see activities with the NAACP and the silent marches. Uh, we see Ida B. Wells' uh, work um, as early as the 1920s and 30s that, that you know, talked about lynching and promoted anti-lynching 
uh, legislation. Uh, we see activity that takes place outside of the American South. And even today, in 2016, we still see problems with second-class citizenship, uh, where the militarized police state are doing some particular, uh, have done some particular things. But I want to share this with you. Um, the famous scholar and historian, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote this about Atlanta. And, and this is something that we should really consider. He wrote, such men are not of sturdy make. They have Atlanta turned resolutely toward the future that held aloft vistas of purple and gold. Atlanta, queen of the cotton kingdom. Atlanta, gateway to the land of the sun. Atlanta, the new Lacases. So the city crowned her hundred hills with factories and stored the shops of cunning handiwork and stretched the mercury in his coming. And the nation talked of her striving. 